Hello, and welcome to another Cloud Podcast, a podcast designed to bring you stories from the smartest minds in IT, operations, and business, and learn how they're using cloud technology to improve business and the customer experience. Artie, my new neighbor, how have you been? Good. Thanks for having me on the podcast. And uh, yeah, new new neighbor, just moved down to Orange County, which is south of LA. Um, you've been here for uh, what seems to be like an eternity, but uh, <laughs> yeah, excited to to be down here. It was funny is that you ended up moving into the same city. We're literally five minutes away from each other and didn't even plan this clearly, but we've known each other for just over, over a year now. And the reason that we blossomed our friendship was all around contact center and it being introduced by, by Doug over at talk desk. And I was like, you know, do you know anyone that's really good at contact center that can help get me educated? Cause that's, I've done UCAS, we've done, I've done circuits in the broker realm in telecom, but it was always like this, well, what's this contact center thing that everyone's talking about? And this was, I guess, yeah, a year and a half ago, or maybe a little bit more. And so that's where I was introduced to TalkDesk and then Doug introduced me to you and contact center extraordinaire. You do some work over at Textile and tell me a little bit about what you guys are doing over there and, and how you got started in the, in the business. So contact center, that is a beast in its own. Um, for anyone who's listening, who knows the acronyms, um, CCAS, so contact center as a service, it, uh, it's, it's completely different than um, the rest of the kind of technology world. It has to play like a UCAS or has to play like a, a telecom type technology, but it also has to have all these weird, unique bells and whistles yeah. uh, that have to be configured and customized. And every call center is completely different. And then some people don't even call them call centers. They call them yeah. tech support teams or just, you know, the team over there that answers the phone, like literally um, there's no standardization, even with the way that we right. declare what that team is and the way that, uh, that we handle it. And I think we're going to talk a little bit about it today in the podcast is um, it's really just brokering conversations between end users or customers or employees and uh, people who can help or support them, whether that's in a sales or marketing world right. or a customer service world. So you could think of it as like an in internal employee at a large corporation contacting a help desk, like that would be a contact center in itself. Yep. Um, or it could be an end user who's a member, um, for example, a member at Textile who uh, bought a pair of shoes from, from Shoe Dazzle and needs to return them or exchange them for a different size. They need to talk to someone who is a representative from Shoe Dazzle. How do you broker that conversation? What are the things that mm -hmm. the agent needs? What are the things that the member needs, you know, while they're waiting on hold? Or is there some sort of IVR or menu where they press one to talk to the sales, two to talk to support? It gets pretty complex pretty fast, and there's really no cookie cutter way to do it. Yeah, you know, it's it's interesting because like you said, like there's no one name for it, right? When we sell a, a hosted phone system or a UCAS, it's you talk to IT, they're the ones making the decision. It's pretty simple most of the time. When it's contact center, I mean, it could be accounting that's struggling with customer support when it comes to the end user. It could be IT with the employee end users. It could be sales, it could be marketing. Like it's really, it can touch every major department within an organization. I've seen some unique setups and some unique teams that that use CCAS or contact center as a service. I've seen like accounting teams. So you've got accounts payable or uh, some team that pays the bills for your, your organization. And, you know, they don't, they don't work that well via, e via email or maybe a, a vendor or supplier that has invoiced your company needs a, he needs a update on that invoice or some payment right away. Um, they might call into a phone number or a queue instead of getting a voicemail, just uh, allow them to set up a callback, uh, you know, call me back as soon as possible. It goes into a callback queue and then a specialist or an, someone from accounts payable can uh, use that tool to, to make that outbound dialed call and then help support whoever the vendor is or whoever the supplier is. So I, I've seen some unique yeah. setups. Um, I've seen it where it's like thousands of call center agents answering calls 
chats, emails, social media posts, all sorts of things blended together. And it's literally millions of conversations every single month. Um, I've also seen teams of like two, like literally two people <laughs> and they want doing all the that, different things. Yeah. Doing everything. And really just, there's two people cause there's only like maybe 10 customers, but when those 10 customers want to contact you, right. They may choose to make a phone call and then it, it's going to ring both phone lines at once, or maybe it's going to bring, you know, go into a queue and it's going to go to one for, person first and then the other person second, kind of like a hunt group where it's like finding the next yeah. available person. So I, I've seen all mixes and, and blends and there is no right or wrong way to do it. Um, there is no secret sauce. I, I think that's what mm. uh, keeps us in business uh, and keeps us employed. Uh, there's always a, a million ways to solve the problem and there's no like best in class way that's cookie cutter for everyone. And that's, that's what makes it fun. And that's why I enjoy it. Yeah. Well, you, I know you love it because I've got your book here. We're going to go into some of the stuff in the book, but mainly like, you know, what inspired you to write it and how long did it take? Like give us a background about, about all your. I always like to say it's two things. It is the world's heaviest business card. Um, so whenever I pass it out, it's like, Hey, here's the the book, but, uh, (laughs) really it's just a business card. It's just basically my own branding. My, uh, it's my, my brain downloaded into, um, into a written form. And then the other thing I like to say is if you don't like the content in the book, it also doubles as a really good coaster. Uh, uh, you probably put a couple, uh, cocktails or martinis on top of it and it'll keep, uh, keep your, your table dry. At least two or three. We'll, we'll squeeze them in there. In the book, and I think we can't, we started to barely touch on it, like, you know, in our conversation a few minutes ago, was I think it all around the customer expectation with all these different channels. And at first, it was all about, you know, voice channel and email. Let's call, and email is even secondary. I think we all grew up, at least if you're born, grew up in the 80s, it was all phone. If you wanted to reach out to a, a business to fix something, it was the phone. And since then it's changed dramatically. How do you see that transition happening still today? And are people still just doing the phone? Yeah, so I I have to tell you the title and how I came up with the title. And that kind of answers the question of, you know, communication styles and phone and email and chat. And now we have social and all these other ones that we'll, we'll deep dive into, but mm-hmm. um, the title of the book is, is Enable yeah. Better Service. So mm-hmm. Enable Better Service, a, a spoiler, you don't have to read the 16 chapters. The spoiler is you have to communicate with your customers and it's pretty pretty simple, right? Um, yeah. So how do, you, how do you enable that? How do you get better? How do you, you have to create an ecosystem um, with technology, the right types of people, the right process, that fosters better communication, whether it's communicating um, over the phone, over chat, over email, communicating fast enough, communicating the right, uh, the right answer or the right message. Um, sometimes non-communication can also help. So replying with things like you know, email replies or having automations or bots so that they don't actually have to talk to a live human. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's, that's the, the world of contact center and service is if you can get better at communicating, you are a better uh, customer service department or customer service team. Same thing with sales and marketing. You could communicate exactly what you're selling exactly to the right person at the right moment. If you're great at that level of communication, you're going to get the sale. You're going to, you're going to be able to market your brand in a better way. So um, the evolution of communication if you think about it all the way, and this is just communication from person to person, goes all the way back to caveman days where they started with, you know, paintings on a wall. Like they would paint a picture of like a bull or a horse. And then the next person who went in that cave knew that like bulls and horses were in this area. So look out for them or hunt them. Right. Um, like that is just a form of communication. It's very visual. And, uh, you know, as it evolved, it went to smoke signals which was also uh, a form of communication back in the day. That was the first kind of mobile communication where you could communicate farther than just someone physically next to you. Yep. And then um, beyond that, it goes into, you know, teleprompts, telewriters, written word, 
you've got the the post mail and the pony express like you know written words across multiple areas and of course invention of the telephone uh invention of morse code transmitting of information across wires electronically transferring via email phone now we've got social media we've got uh voice devices that I, I can't say the words otherwise my voice devices will start replying back to me in this room <laughs> but uh that that's the evolution of communication so as a as a um customer or as a company the the more that you adapt to those new communication tools the better leg up you have not only against your your competitors but also the better you get with regards to what we call customer experience um and and that is at the pinnacle of you know that's the top of the the mountain that you need to reach if you want to have the best performing team right. you need to make sure that you you communicate so that evolution is something to always think about and um it's really it's funny with that evolution you'll notice that some of those things are uh writ written some of those are verbal uh some of those you can hear something and then respond verbally. Some things yeah. you can read things and see them, and then you have to write or type using your physical fingers. So the evolution of how we communicate with each other as humans has changed over time so much so that now when you talk to one of your at-home devices, it converts or dictates your, your voice into text, and then that text gets transmitted and then on the other side, the person who's getting it can either choose to hear it through uh, a voice recording talking mm -hmm. back to you, um, but like synthesized text-to-speech, text -to or they could read it. Like it could be um, like a digital voicemail that you get and you may not want to listen to the voicemail, you might want to read it. So it's really weird. Everyone could have different preferences of how they want to communicate and still communicate with each other. You don't have to you don't have to enjoy the same communication type as the person who's trying to communicate to you. Yeah. And that's, it brings up a really interesting point because now it's as a business, you're looking to communicate as best as possible with your, with your customers or your end users, if you want to call it that. Now it's okay. Who is our customer base and how do we best communicate with them? How do they want to be communicated with? And now it's what tools are in place or are available to communicate with our with our ideal customer. Yeah, and I'll I'll flip the script on you. So I'll put you on the spot a little bit here and ask All you right. a question. So when was the last time you had a a great experience, whether it was like at a coffee shop or oh. uh, you know, maybe you you texted a company and they texted back in two seconds, or you, you picked up the phone and you you were mad at something and, and you know halfway through the conversation you were happy like well yeah tell us a little bit about it what was the the best experience i've got i've times? got good and i've got bad but i'll i'll give you the good and it actually happened last last weekend or over like the last few days over the weekend and it was delta we ended up you know taking a flight and i hadn't flown for a while for obvious reasons uh and as my bags were loaded and i'm walking to security line i get a text message saying like bags are on the plane just and that's not even like a, a you know a contact center solution that's just good customer service right it's get is communicating with me that my bags are safe and like how many times have you heard or seen the movie like meet the fuckers where they get the bags mixed up and now I'm, it was a ski trip so if i go to jackson hole and my skis and all my equipment don't show up like i'm gonna have to break a credit card out and buy all new gear just so I, or rent just so I can have a enjoyable weekend. But now I know the bags are on there. You get text messages, updates, makes it very user-friendly. And that's just one piece of, I think, Delta's great customer experience. And there's other airlines that we've all flown that are the bargain airlines where it's just, it's the nitty gritty, it's not good. And, but I was very, very impressed with, with Delta's customer service and, and how, they, how they treated me as a customer. I mean, that's what's great about customer experience is that we, we're all there. We've all had experiences and we just happen to be two people that get to implement it for companies by these contact center solutions. And so we all can relate to customer experience, which is, which is fun. 
I love that. And I also, strangely enough, just recently took Delta as well and had an amazing experience. And the same thing, I, uh, similar but different. When we landed in New Orleans, uh, it said the captain's name. It said, you know, message from the captain. You know, mm-hmm. I can't remember his name. Captain Steve, we'll call him. Um, you know, welcome to New Orleans. Hope you guys traveled safe. You know, please fly again. And at first I was like, that's probably an automated message or something like that. But <laughs> in the message, there was a typo. So I knew either they either planned that or oh. I knew <laughs> that he actually landed yeah. and he had some sort of either on his phone or a laptop where he could, it, it, he was required to say some sort of message uh, at the end of the trip. And he typed it out and, and sent it to us and all the passengers who, who had that enabled got that message. And I was like, it was one of those kind of like, I don't hate this. I, I don't love it. It just, I expect it. Like I expect like right. to get off the plane and someone to like stand there and the captain of the door open and be like, welcome to New Orleans, like have a great day. But during the pandemic, they can't have that door open to expose like, you know, mm-hmm. their staff to a lot of people walking in and out. So they, they created a different way to communicate that. And I, I felt like it was great. In fact, I'd prefer it even past pandemic to, to have more text messages. I wouldn't mind if he texted me right now and being like, Hey, like, uh, you know, a month ago you flew with us just thinking yeah. about you. Hope you fly with Delta again. I'd be like, Oh, that's cool. Like, cool. Maybe uh, a little creepy. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, like felt yeah. like he was like my friend or something. Like he's got yeah. my, my text message phone number. Might as well, might as well, might as well use it. What do you, so I can remember like the first, like, customer experience where I really learned like, wow, this is a big piece of business. And it was from the late, I think his name is, last name is, is Tony Hesch. If you pronounce it right from Zappos, right? And his, the, the wow, right, for, for clients. And I read his book and that was really the first time I experienced or learned how important a customer experience was and how they, I feel like he was really game-changing in the, for the whole industry. And like his imprint is still, still going for a company, bettering companies because of his philosophies. When I first started about 15 years ago in this industry, and it's strange that you brought this up because I don't think we've ever talked about it in the past, but Mm -hmm. one of the first call centers that I toured was Zappos and it was in um, Las Vegas. And there's so many things that that company did right, even to, for us who were touring. So we were call center professionals. We had probably... 10 people on the tour, they did tours literally every single day and people could come tour their facility if, if you wanted to. A call center in um, in Las Vegas, I think it was about 800 people um, in that location. And if you don't know Zappos, they sell shoes online and they have mm-hmm. amazing customer service, probably like gold standard, platinum standard. You're not going to get better than that unless you literally copy the playbook. Mm-hmm. Um, we, uh, we arrived and... Um, to Las Vegas, there was a sign, there was a, an employee of Zappos, like not a hired person, but an employee from Zappos, Zappos shirt on, kind of like geeky, nerd, nerdy type call center person, you could tell, with a sign that had all of our names on it. <clears throat> we um, we got on the bus, it's literally a Zappos bus, like a small uh, school bus that had Zappos on the side drove us while we were driving from the airport in, they had a seat that had a box full of books. And it wasn't um, Tony's book. It was just a bunch of customer service or leadership books. By the way, this this was a, a free experience. You just had to sign up and then fill out some criteria to make sure okay. that they validated that you, you worked for a call center. Um, so they said, you know, we're all about learning and development and that's a big pinnacle of our business. And we do that for employees, but we also do it for all of this outer sphere, the people who are in our industry. So come over into this box and pick out a book and you can have one. And of course, you know, you pick it out now because it's a 20 minute drive to the call center and you can read it on the way, or you could uh, pick it up on the way back uh, to your hotel. So uh, one, I thought that was amazing. White glove service. We show up, um, we do the tour and we ask them all these unique questions, like what makes you special? What makes it great? All this stuff. And um, how do you retain your employees? Cause that was a big thing. Uh, employee retention in the call centers. How do you do that? Cause people are 40 hour 
long employees taking 20 to 80 calls a day, like how do you keep that employee happy? Um, and one of the responses was, well, we have um, free Wi-Fi. We have like bunk space so that people can take naps or literally spend the night if they want to. There's like private rooms that you could yeah. uh, book through their online booking system. And then um, full shower, gym, all that stuff. And um, all the food on campus is free. And we were like, oh, okay, makes sense. You, you, yeah. you literally have created a compound um, where pe- it's really hard for people to want to go home. Like, why do you want to leave if you could just grab a quick dinner and then and get home a little bit later and, and maybe work an extra hour for mm-hmm. overtime? So that, that was a piece of it. And then um, the, the follow-up question that we had after the retention question was, what makes your employees, how do you, how do you enable them so that they can be the best that they could possibly be? Because in a traditional call center, it's always like, oh, I'm sorry, an agent will have to say like, oh, I'm sorry, I can't do that. I have to escalate you to a supervisor or I'm sorry, that's against my policy or just the hard, like, no, I can't do that for you. And that's the worst worst experience you could ever give to a customer is I can't do it or I don't have the power or I have to go to a supervisor or you have to escalate to their, my manager, you have to go through like, all these hoops to get your problem solved. How Zappos does it is not only do they enable all of their frontline team members to do anything that their supervisors and directors can do, so there's no escalation path. It's literally, oh, you, you want a full refund? I don't think you should get it, but I'll give it to you. Like I have the power to do that. I, I don't have to hide behind some sort of supervisor escalation mm-hmm. path. So that that was one thing. And the other thing was that Tony gave all of the call center reps a $20 monthly allowance and that $20 monthly allowance had to be for a special gift for one of the customers they helped during that month so um and if you ever read the book uh his book it'll describe a couple of those examples but the the one that kind of sticks out in my mind the most I think it was in a, a blog I don't think it was specifically in his book was um, someone was buying shoes for their wedding and the shoes show up and they're the wrong size and the wedding is in like two days, right? So there's nothing that the Zappos agent can do other than refund the money, apologize, try to do rush shipping, but it's mm-hmm. not going to get there in two days. There's absolutely no way. So um, the agent found out where they were getting married, did some like research, like looked on Facebook and like figured out the hotel that they were getting married and um, sent you know, flowers to the room. And then when the person arrived uh, to check in for their wedding, opened the door and it was flowers from the Zappos um, customer service rep saying like, so sorry, but I hope you guys have a great wedding. Here are some flowers, uh, congratulations on, on your nuptials. So that's, that's just a great example of customer yeah. service right there. It's, it's great and it enables the employees, right? And even that specific example of like, being able to help someone out. I mean, just psychologically, like people like to give because of the dopamine rush they get from being nice to somebody. A piece of the psychology and it works too, but I think ultimately it's, yeah, you're you're helping your customers out. And even if there was no way to fix that, that shoe order for the wedding, like at least they felt like they were taken care of. They felt like they were loved, right? And it's it's so interesting because I feel like with with Zappos and they like you talk about being able to sleep there, you eat there, there's a gym there. I mean, this is right before the bubble pops in technology. And it was like game, I feel like Google probably got ideas from from Zappos and Apple and how to like treat your employees well. Cause I can't remember before that where you heard about all these, the Google campus and how amazing it is. I feel like Zappos really led the way on that one. Yeah, I feel like their empowerment to their employees is what sets them apart. The whole experience of getting on the bus and getting a free book, it all probably stemmed from his idea of, I'm gonna empower the people uh, that are on my team to come up with ideas and run with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was probably like, someone's like, hey, we should do tours of the call center. And he was like, great, sounds like a great idea, set it up. You know, what what do you need funding wise? And then, you know, later on, they probably said like, hey, you know, it's really boring from the airport to the office. Like, why don't we give them something to do that's cool, fun and engaging so they're not on their phones 
or whatever it is. Like, why don't we give them a book? And then they could take it home and then they could like learn from it and it's going to sit on their shelf. I still have the book that I, I grabbed. And that was like 15 mm-hmm. years ago. I, I'll reference it all the time. It's, mm-hmm. it's um, uh, a carrot a day. And it's, it's literally a book, 365 pages. You flip to it and it tells you, you know, a, a little tidbit or, or something knowledgeable that can help you out in the professional world. And that's, that's something I'll never forget. And, you know, I might forget some things that happened on that tour and that event, but I'll never forget the experience that I had. And I wasn't even a customer of Zappos. I was just um, trying to learn from them. So it even yeah. treated us like they were customer, that we were customers. It's amazing. It, and it, it really comes down to culture, right? And how it comes from the top down. And like, what's interesting is that you've, so we, we work with businesses all over the country, you and I, and helping with the contact centers and all of these tools are avail- available to them to just wow the customer, just like Zappos has always wowed the customer, right? So like, where do you see like the limitations or where are companies getting like just stopped at that moment where like someone says like, oh, we can be great, but it's not happening. That's a great question. I think the answer is, um, I love this phrase, it's called uh, choice apathy. So when you've got too many choices out there, it's hard for you to choose. If it's just two choices, or one choice, it's pretty easy to choose. Like the one choice while you're getting that, that's all it is. If it's two, it's like, okay, that's not bad. One, A or B. Right. If it's three, it's like, okay, A, B or C. Like it's still tangible, but with the products that are out there today and the internet of things and all of these clouds that are around those products, they could, a lot of them can do a lot of what the other ones can do. And some of them have some secret sauce that sets them apart, but for the most part, they're relatively the same ecosystems and same bare requirements and feature sets. So when you're looking at the board, it's like 20 or 30 different options. And you're like, I don't know which one's best for me. Maybe half of them are best for me, or maybe one is, I don't know. It's like a needle in the haystack. So I think that's where the barrier starts for people in the buying position. Um, I also think to empower your employees to do things, if you empower them to do whatever they want under the sun and you don't give them guidelines, that might be choice apathy too. They might be like, I don't know what to do. Like, I don't know how to spend this $20. Like I know I'm supposed to spend this $20 on some customer, but like Mm -hmm. what, I mean, there's so many options out there in the world. Do I give them an Amazon gift card? Do I give them a, you know, some flowers? Do I, like, who do I choose? I've talked to 300 people this last month. Like, which person is more valuable than the other. So um, that's where we always get stuck. That that level of like good or great customer service to exceptional. It's like there's a barrier or a layer of what what are my options? I have too many, then I'm just gonna not do anything. I'll just stay yeah. at, at status quo. I'm not gonna make a change. And that's usually what happens is people do this huge, RFP or request for proposal and they'll research a product and maybe boil it down to three or four different options. And they'll say, you know what? That's just too much work to do any one of those. So I'm just gonna stay where it is. Everything's kind of okay and okay is good enough for me. And that's uh, that's where we hit the wall. Yeah, and I think, and it comes down to that culture and like if the CEO, CEOs technology forward thinking like let's push the boundaries on technology then absolutely they're jumping into these new realms of contact center what's interesting too is you know we look at the everybody that's on a pbx or like an on-prem contact center solution and it's that analysis paralysis or i don't want to lose my job by going from the stable avaya or stable cisco system it's getting the job done today but and there's nothing really pushing us over the edge to move to the cloud even though there's all these great things at the cloud and all the bots and all the AI and what it can do, but it it's that forklift of we're moving from one completely like platform that I'm used to. We've been using it for 15, 10, 15 years to this. Everyone's talking about the cloud and like, it seems great, but they don't want to lose their jobs either. If they push their boss, their COO or their CEO to transition to a new system and it completely you know, poops on itself. <laughs> it's like, that's their job on the line, right? Yeah, that um, paralysis is probably the hardest thing to get past. 
and whenever I coach people, whether it's through like a procurement or purchasing decision or just in life in general, what what I like to do is give them a little sense of their ecosystem. So especially in the, the business world, I'll be like, all right, well, you know, let's say it's an insurance company and they're thinking about moving to the cloud and they, they've got on-prem today. And it's like, well, everything works okay today. So there's no real reason to change. Um, I might push them a little bit and say, all right, well, you know, let's say all of your competitors in the insurance industry and in your industry, um, they do the same, except for one decides to move to the cloud. And maybe they're getting some sort of benefit that you're not getting or that you're not seeing. Maybe it's um, cheaper product, uh, for example. And if that's the case, then they'll use that budget towards sales and marketing so that they're gonna have a higher sales and marketing budget over yeah. your business, you're gonna lose business. Um, or let's say it's not cost. Let's say um, they create the experience that you described that you had with Delta. Like they have the ability now to send outbound text messages to follow up and create that better customer experience. Customers are eventually gonna leave because they're gonna get a better experience through your competitor at the same cost. You know, the competitor's paying the same amount as you are. So there's all of these little incentives to do it. And it's, even if all of your competitors aren't migrating to the cloud and there isn't that like, I have to do it now because competitor right. XYZ is doing it. You should be the bleeding or cutting edge company to force your competitors to scratch their head and go, wait a minute, what just happened? Like how, how is our competitor beating us? It's like, how can they have that much marketing spend? Oh, it's because they saved half a million dollars on their telephony bills because they have this new cloud-based solution or like how are they uh, sending SMS text messaging out? It's like, oh, it's because you could spin them up so much faster with the cloud-based product versus having to like piece it together and, and use an on-prem system and procure the phone number and the short code and then make sure it's regionalized to where you're sending the text right. messaging. So um, so speed and, and uh, reducing of costs and all of those play a key, key factor. Um, I do have a question for you though. Uh oh. <laughs> and this goes back to, I, I wasn't going to let you off the hook on this one, but um, you said you had a good experience, but you also had a bad experience. Oh boy. Uh, so I'd love to hear the bad customer experience that you've had, because those are always great uh, learning examples and stories for us to, to learn from as customer service professionals. I'll do the courtesy of not naming the company, but I'll say that it is a major manufacturer of kitchen appliances, right? Refrigerators, ovens, stovetops. So this situation was with our oven and we have this double oven, it's great, the wife loves it. But first the uh, the glass breaks as we're doing the cleaning process, right? So high heat, it's going through and all of a sudden the glass shatters from the, in, the inside pane of glass. I'm like, Luckily it was still under warranty, they came out, they fixed it, it was fine. Then like, it must have been a month after the the year manufacturer warranty, which is just bogus because it's to me it's too short. So after that first year, the motherboard on the the screen that controls everything goes out and just fries. And we tried we tried calling the manufacturer, crickets. We tried calling the the, the company that sold us, you know, the uh, the retailer. Nothing they can do. It's out of warranty, and you know you're we're kind of just like we're stuck. So it's like, great. Okay. So shell out 400, $500 to get this thing fixed. And then like another little bit ago, a little bit after that, the bottom pane of glass broke. And so we had to pay out of pocket for that too. And to me, it's like, okay, you can stand hard on your, on your process and your, your rules and your policies to say, okay, if it's a year, sorry, no good. But as a manufacturer, if you're going to make a good product, you think that you'd want to last more than one year before things start to break. And that's where it's just doing what's right for the customer. Because now I, I've told this story dozens of times to friends and yourself included. And now I'm sure like when you go to purchase your new kitchen appliances, like you're going to think twice before going to that brand because of, because of our experience. But, and here we are on the flip side, talking all these great things about Zappos and what they're doing or Delta and what they're doing. And it, there's, there's a number there. I don't know how you quantify it, but that referral business, that positive word of mouth business has, can just 
be really good or it could be really bad. And then, yeah, in that case, it was, it was terrible. And when you turn the oven off, the fan goes for probably 20 minutes. And every time we, every time it finally goes off after we've cooked something and we're talking, it's like, oh, it's so quiet here now because this fan's not running. And this is a name, big name brand appliance company that you would never think that it would have this kind of issue. And yeah, I mean, that, that's my negative experience, but it's super frustrating. <laughs> yeah, it, man, I, I can only sympathize. Um, just moving into a new house, you don't want the appliances to break. If the house is the skeleton of the, the household, the appliances are literally the um, organs, you know, the, the heart and yeah. the, the soul. And I mean, most, most people on this podcast have probably experienced a blackout or a brownout, depending on where you are For in sure. the world. But the power going out for 10 minutes feels like so foreign. Um, thankfully, we have phones that have lights on the back of them. But what do you do with your life? The internet's out. There's no, there's no power. You, you could do, you could, if you have a gas stove, you could cook food, I guess. But there's like, there's nothing to do. The refrigerator is going to go warm fast. So you better start eating and drinking as much as you can. Right. Unless you know yeah. it's going to come back. So um, just imagine that in your environment, um, you know, your, your cooking appliance, the thing that you have to feed yeah. your kids on, you know, it yeah. are, it's down and you don't know how far, how long it's going to be down for. And then you can't get it fixed. It's like, it's almost like you're having like a heart attack and there's a, you're trying to call doctors and they're like, Oh, we're sorry. Well, we can't help you um, <laughs> because you don't have a warranty anymore. This is how my family eats food. So it, we need right. to figure it out. Right. Um, so what about uh, communication? So, you know, I know that you probably called them and emailed them, escalated and all of that. It, could they have done something better communication wise? If Zappos owned that company, and they had like the easiest way to get in contact with the right person. Yeah. But like, what would your preference be? So this one, it was definitely a, the 800 number type of solution. But for me, I would want to be able to go to their website and just deal. Um, you're working all day, right? So we're in between conference calls. Sometimes we're just listening in on webinars or things that aren't as important. So you can just take care of some business while you're there. Like a chat bot would have been perfect. Give them the order number, give them the part number, whatever, and then have them dial it up right there and get, and get it fixed, right? Um, if it wasn't chat, not so much SMS, but just a simple, we call them IVR, right? But a simple phone tree in the for the 800 number, or just to get a, a rep that gets on the phone and sympathize, empathizes with you on, oh man, that's horrible. Like I would be totally pissed if this happened to my oven. So those two channels to me like are great I tried the whole, uh, the tweet it out there thing where people tweet, but I'm not, a, I don't have enough influence. I don't have the blue little <laughs> thing next to my name. The verified. Where it's like, oh, like these, you know, you let it start trending. That didn't happen. So I tried that. Next time something breaks, I'm pretty much just going to buy a new one and just get rid of the brand. So I'll have a different Ugh. brand oven and then a different brand stove top and fridge. At some point you just got to throw in the towel and get something new, right? There's something to be said about just being able to call a number and talk to someone, even if they can't fix your problem, just to have them listen, because it's like a therapist, you get it off your chest, but you're getting yeah, off totally. your chest to the company. So you feel like one, you were heard and it's going to be logged somewhere in a case or something. Someone has access to that data at some point in time, but two, it also prevents you from telling everyone on your podcast or, you know, like telling, right? yeah. telling everyone that, you know, around you, which affects, uh, that score that you mentioned earlier, it's actually called, uh, NPS or net right. promoter score. Yeah. If they just had a way for you to vent and feel like you right. got it off your chest, their net promoter score or their like word of mouth to use this company would probably improve even in the limited sphere of influence that you have, you have more sphere of influence than you think, yeah. because you might've told someone like a me or like someone else who is a close friend and, and they might have uh, 30,000 followers and they might tweet something out that says like, Hey, I just heard from my buddy that he bought this and it was a horrible experience, yada, yada, yada. Right. So, and that'll kill uh, you. On the death customer. by a million paper cuts is, is exactly. That. And now it's like, <laughs> with just the way social media is today. And, you know, yeah, it gets out there and as a small business, oh my gosh, it could destroy you. This one won't get destroyed by my little mishap, but it adds up, right? So. Yeah. 
and that's funny it's it, it might not be your intent either like you might be frustrated but you don't want to end a business or ruin their lives you just want right. a better product but you know justice. the end result could uh, <laughs> yeah you're like get retribution but uh yeah no it, it, it's 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 strange how this world is and how social media is and how uh, from that communication platform, we are so polarized and there, it's things can escalate even beyond the original creator of the content's control right. where they like post something and like, you know, someone yeah. else might pick it up and it could go viral and you're, you might retract it and say, no, no, no. Like, you know, I don't want this to too late. reflect to X, Y, and Z, but it, it could be too late. You see that a lot with the airlines, right? Something happens, some guy from behind the person in the seat behind is recording the whole thing. It gets out there and then it's out there. And it seems to kind of be the same culprits in a lot of times where we see these same things happen. Only if I have to take this airline, am I going to take this airline? Or if it's like extremely cheap, then you take that airline. But now this is this has been a great conversation already, and we're gonna have more of these. This is our inaugural. You and me, we're gonna bring some guests on, and just dive deeper into these other channels. I mean, we basically just scratched the surface when it comes to contact center, and really around customer experience and how the different channels can set up a business to thrive and to offer that experience, and ultimately drive revenue. We're looking forward to some of the some of the other ones we're going to have as well. Absolutely, pleasure is all mine, and I feel like uh, my expertise in call center and contact center, coupled with your expertise in VoIP and uh, carriers and connectivity and all of all that complexity, um, we've really covered a lot of bases. A little teaser for an upcoming yep. uh, couple of podcasts: we are going to be asking people who do know more than us. It's going to be great to have kind of a, a three person podcast or maybe four or five or yeah. six where we're really just having a topic where literally you and I have no knowledge about it at all. And we're just educating ourselves and asking questions. Exactly. And it's all, all for the, for the growth and for customer experience. So if you guys are out there, check out Artie's book It is on Amazon enable better service and we will catch up next time. And appreciate the time Artie. Love it. Thanks so much. Thanks, Alex. Thanks, everyone. Well, that wraps up the show for today. Thanks for joining. And don't forget to join us next week as we bring another guest in to talk about the trends around cloud contact center and customer experience. Also, you can find us at AdlerAdvisors.com, LinkedIn, or your favorite podcast platform. We'll see you next week on another cloud podcast.